Okay, hello everyone. We're going to get started. It's noon. Uh, thank you all very much for coming today to the September WIT session. Everyone in the room, welcome. And everyone online, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Sarpil Bayraktar, and I'm your host and the program lead for WIT sessions. Well, I'm so pleased to see so many of you showed up uh, for this really interesting session. Uh, we're talking IoT today, and I have a treat for you, someone, a speaker who's been working in this area since 2005, and she was the first software developer at Jasper. So I'm really pleased to uh, share uh, Sparna's uh, experience with you, and I'm also looking forward to the talk myself. So please help me welcome Sparna Kumar to the community. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I see a few brave men in the audience, so I uh, <laughs> really, really want to welcome them. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the time that you've taken to hear me out here. So let's hope I do justice. <laughs> All right, so here's the agenda. <laughs> A little bit about myself, uh, I'll introduce the Jasper Control Center, um, then um, the journey from a few connected devices to millions of connected devices, um, then the acquisition uh, to Cisco, and then uh, going on to uh, now, uh, and then I'll have uh, 15 minutes towards the end for questions, but feel free to ask questions if you have any uh, in the middle. So 2005, um, I got a call from a recruiter <coughs> that uh, there was this uh, very small stealth startup, uh, but very interesting set of people. Um, there was no website or anything. They had no information if I, if I wanted to talk to them. So uh, at the time, I, would, uh, uh, I was working for a company called Oblix, which is a web security software company uh, that had got just acquired by Oracle. So um, the commute for me from, for, was from San Jose all the way to Oracle. So I said, well, you know what, I'll, I'll talk to these guys. Uh, so I met with the team, and uh, specifically I met with uh, Jangir, and uh, he explained to me the, uh, the overall business strategy, the business, business value prop for. So how the idea came about was that he was on a vacation. Uh, driving uh, a rental car. He was uh, somewhere close to Tahoe right, driving a rental car and the check engine light came on. So, you know, he thought to himself, you know, wouldn't it be nice if the car would tell me um, what is the problem and better still, like, here's a mechanic close by, go get the car checked out and you can then go on and have the rest of the vacation. So, from there he got the idea that car as a uh, thing had been around for, for centuries actually, but uh, for, for, for a long time, but it had this one time sale where you sell the car and, and that's it. He wanted to change that to a recurring revenue model where uh, not only do you sell the car, but you also sell a service along with the car, this kind of service that you know would have been extremely useful for him at that time. So that was how he thought of as was the business model. And so when he explained that to me, you know, um, I thought, wow, this is amazing. Uh, you know, it's not just the car, but what about the copy machine? You know, when you go to the copy machine, it's always out of paper. So what if the copy machine, you know, the vendor would always provide the service of making it fully functional all the time? That, that would be amazing. There are so many other things out there that could value, get value from this kind of a service. And it's valuable. It's very simple to understand. That was the beauty of the whole thing. It was very simple to understand. And um, the value prop was amazing. So it's a recurring revenue model, wonderful. So the other thing, this is, remember, this is 2005, <laughs> 2005. Uh, this is pre-iPhone. <laughs> this is uh, pre-AWS. 
So there were these two separate giant worlds. You know, we, people had cell phones, they could make voice calls, phone calls. Uh, then there was this giant internet that was there, dot com boom, etc. And I'd been through that. I was part of a, a software company that had taken advantage of the soft, the internet boom. Um, so this was going to be interesting. This was going to be uh, a brand new set of devices uh, which would bring the two giant worlds together. It would be sitting in the middle. It would be a new set of devices connecting, using the cellular network to connect to the internet um, and send data over the internet. Just, just so many things that could be done. So not only was it a great um, uh, business model with recurring revenue, but it was also uh, for me as an engineer, it was uh, something nobody had done before. It was uh, as an as engineering challenge. So, uh, I, you know, and if we were to do it right, then we could be connecting a billion devices. So, you know, I had my, you know, Sheryl Sandberg kind of moment where you kind of, if you all know that one, right, you've just been offered a seat in a rocket ship. Uh, kind of moment and I said well you know what even though my son was one and a half years old I was worried it's a small startup uh, I said well you know I got a seat I'm gonna take it so that's how it got started so the early days uh, so this is what we were starting to do um, we were gonna build a data network a global data network so in order to do that you uh, you know just like your cell phones you mean you know, you there's a roaming interconnect uh, we figured out how to use a standard mobile operator roaming interconnect uh, roam on the wireless network so in order to do that we actually had to become a mobile operator so the first name that we had was Jasper wireless um, we acquired some spectrum of Alaska and became a member of um, GSM Association. We got our own MZ range, so sorry. <laughs> own MZ range, our own uh, MSIs, in, and, and, and we launched ourselves as a wireless carrier. And uh, the second part of it was to control this global data network. And this is where we wanted to build um, a software as a service platform. It had to be five nines available. Um, reliable carrier grade and uh, our goal was to build it for scale to be able to connect a billion devices so what that was the genesis of control center how it got started um, so what was control center going to do it was going to control these devices it was going to activate deactivate these wireless devices uh, provide visibility if there was a connectivity problem then uh, given ability to diagnose the problem and see what's going on with the network. Why is it not able to connect? Uh, of course, if you're using the network, we want you to build. We want to build for it. So make sure we are building. And also along the way, these are uh, IoT devices. So unlike the cell phone, nobody really manages it personally. So we wanted to have automation around it, so things could be managed automatically. So this was. Uh, this was what control center would be doing uh, and, and for doing this we would get a recurring revenue. So, so the early days. Um, so before I get into more details, this is a diagram of how a device uh, this has a SIM card in it, much like your cell phone. So just like the cell phone has a SIM card, the car in this case would have a SIM card in it. It would connect using uh, the wireless network. It would go to the cell towers, the cell towers go to the wireless core network and then it would hit this um, box called the HLR. So this is the home location registrar. Uh, it's an important component of the wireless network where you keep all the SIM information. So this allows access. So it has the authentication keys and it, it, uh, it given the SIM it will allow the SIM to either access the network or not access the network. So I just want to introduce the HLR. And the second thing is uh, the GGS. And once the authentication part is done, then if the device was going to set up a data session, it would go through this thing called the GGSN, which is the uh, GPRS uh, gateway node. And this is where the data session is set up. Once the data session is set up, the gateway node also uses the radius protocol to do one more authentication check. Uh, and after that, once the data is set up, 
the device is then ready to go and um, go to the internet, download weather, whatever, just go to Google, whatever you want to do. So that, that's how the, it works on the cellular network. So <coughs> what did we do? What did we do? So the first thing I built, I'll talk a little bit about the stuff that uh, I built. We had, uh, I joined on the 1st of November. Uh, uh, to 2005 and uh, we had three uh, software engineers and uh, Amit who is uh, sitting in the audience so there was uh, three four of us and then uh, what did I do so I like I said I came from a security software company so I built the first thing I did was to build the security framework for control center so role-based access control um, as well as the overall security so that's the first thing I did uh, the second thing was to figure out how to integrate with the HLR. Um, so uh, we were using uh, an Aperture HLR and, uh, at the time, and uh, so it was the it was not the era of APIs. So you actually there was some basic stuff, but we had to work closely with the vendor and kind of figure out how we, uh, in real time, provision and uh, you know allow access etc so that was that was where the deep integration pieces came from um, the third thing so one of the things that uh, we wanted to do was have everything as real time so uh, I talked about the GGSN right this is where it keeps track of the data sessions so it the GGSN creates these CDRs which is called data records which is then used to build the subscriber if they use the network so most of the uh, chart and then Charging gateway is a gateway that will receive these CDRs. So most of the um, available um, charging gateways would, you know, work in batch mode. Uh, you would dump the CDRs into a file, and you. So, you know, when you're a startup, you have to make some important decisions. Are you going to build the software? Are you going to buy? Are you going to do both? So on one side, you can you can buy and system integrate it, or you know, or you can build it, but you have to sort of remember what is that what is it that we are looking to do so one of the core things that we wanted to do was to make sure that we have everything real time so everything had to be real time so we built our own just i built the charging gateway so we could get the records in real time so that was uh, that gave us a little bit of edge in the market uh, we also tried to build our own AAA server, so, uh, but it was taking a little bit more time. So uh, when we launched, we actually launched with the Cisco AAA server. Uh, but over time, <coughs> again, uh, to be low cost, to have real time visibility, more access and more control, uh, we have built our own AAA server and uh, we kind of replaced Cisco's AAA server over time. So March. This is the day we launched uh, Control Center. Uh, really ancient. This was the entire company. This is everybody. This is the CEO. This is the sales team. Um, you know, everybody's a little, looking a little bit younger. Of course, I look the same. <laughs> uh, there in that uh, um, uh, pink shirt. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you can recognize me even, <laughs> but yeah, so this is everybody. This is uh, IT, HR, sales, everybody in the company. It was a big day, big day for us. So um, that was uh, uh, when we launched with one customer. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So our big break really came uh, when we uh, made a deal with AT&T. So just a little bit of an uh, anecdote there. Uh, Amazon uh, Kindle had just come out. And uh, so uh, somebody presented the AT&T CEO with the Kindle and he asked, is it on AT&T? And the answer was no. So then he looked at his exec team and said, hey, make it happen. It has to be on AT&T. <laughs> So, uh, you know, so that's how uh, they approached us. We got started with our discussion. And uh, so really, uh, for us, uh, the rocket ship that has started, started taking off. Um, so, of course, luck played a big role uh, in us getting the at and deal. If it wasn't for the Kindle, I don't know. But, uh, but really, uh, it was not just luck. Uh, we had sort of built a bestseller product. So let me 
um, since the early days, what all did we do? So it was not just the deep network integration that uh, I talked about early. We also built a very intuitive UI, uh, which was working with real-time data at scale, which is a fairly uh, hard problem to do. Uh, we also had global APIs that enterprises could connect with, uh, you know, large enterprises could do. Uh, we also had built up our uh, data-driven automation engine, uh, also working at high scale with high volumes of data. So all of this made for a very good product in the market. We, are, we were way ahead of our uh, competition and uh, that is what enabled us uh, to work with AT&T. Um, so, let me walk you through some of the design principles uh, that we used to uh, guide ourselves throughout the journey. So, as I mentioned, the first goal was to have a carrier grade five nines uh, availability product. So, it is not just the features, but it's uh, and not that uh, it would work at scale, but it had to be reliable. If if, if people were going to use it in their cars and if uh, they had to use it in mission critical uh, devices, it had to be reliable. You had to have a good reputation. So that was the goal. It had to work at scale. And also, uh, we had to innovate very fast. We had to innovate quickly and keep up with the market. We also had to build to sustain because whatever technology choices you make, over long period of time, it is going to change. So we had to build to make it sustainable for years to come. And anything at scale has to be built at low cost because you can, you can never really scale if your cost is high. So this was, these were the guiding principles. I, I talked about uh, you know, uh, some of these things. So just walking through, what does it mean really to have five nights? What does it mean? So just uh, if you do the math, it means that you can have less than one second of downtime per day. That has to be by design. It doesn't happen accidentally. It has to be by design. So that was uh, everything and everything that we designed had to have that in mind. Um, <clears throat> so building a system for a billion devices, how do you do that? It seems daunting, right, when you get started, but like, uh, uh, just using core computer science principles, divide and conquer. So we said, okay, well, we don't start to build a big system for one billion devices. We start, like a, take a container, make it scale for 10 to 20 million devices, and then we run out of that, then make another container. So that was uh, how we thought about it, concept of pod. So there was a computing pod, it would scale to 10 to 20 million devices depending on how many we wanted to support and then we would add more pods as and when we needed and then we could have 100 pods and then that way we could get a billion devices. So that's uh, sort of the overall understanding of how we started doing this. Uh, rapid innovation, we, uh, the, the software as a service platform. Um, we have been doing three weeks release cycle from the very beginning from 2006. Uh, every three weeks we update our software and uh, it has even till date I have many familiar faces in the audience from the Jasper team so they're all nodding uh, we have been doing three weeks uh, the whole time um, and uh, sustainable it had to be um, sustainable so when you do these releases they have and make sure to have the five nines so uh, it has to be disruption free it has to just work so I'll give you a little bit example about technology choices. Uh, when we started, we started with Oracle database. So as we started uh, getting a lot of data, especially the diagnostics data, which scales uh, at 10x per device uh, per day. So um, we said, well, you know, Oracle is not, relational database is not a good fit. Uh, so we built our own data store. Uh, we called it Jasper Vault. And uh, this was a key value pair in memory database. You could access it quickly, it was fast. Uh, and then after some time, uh, Redis and NoSQL became uh, really popular choices in the market. So we said, well, you know what, let's go to Redis. So we started using, um, we moved first from the database, we moved to our own implementation, then we moved to Redis. Uh, but even with Redis, we were having 
difficulty scaling at the volumes that we were getting. So, uh, so we were using this Lua script, but then that wasn't scaling very well. So we, we looked at the Redis source code, uh, we customized some of the Redis function, and with that, uh, then we were able to scale to the level that uh, you know, worked for us. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that what, what we did is along the way is that we started simple, started, started with simple, simple choices. But then we were not afraid to get into the nitty gritty of the details. Uh, if you're using open source, then be comfortable with changing open source. Uh, scale as you go, uh, solve those hard problems and kind of design for it. So that's uh, really, uh, over time, we have, you know, we are constantly upgrading. Low cost, uh, you know, um, I mentioned some of the key core infrastructure pieces like AAA server, charging gateway, all of that. We built it ourselves. Um, so, <coughs> so that's what we did. All right. So along the way, along the way, um, I was also uh, kind of growing my team. So it was not just a technology journey, it was also my own personal journey. Uh, the first hire, first hire is a very, very special <laughs> hire. Uh, I, uh, you know, um, it took a long time to hire this person. Um, and, and there were some trade-offs to be made though. So I, I interviewed many, many people, many, many people. And uh, the person I eventually ended up hiring, he's amazing engineer, really sharp, really smart, but he had, you know, some um, challenges, some communication issues. But so when we were doing the interview, um, so, uh, you know, it was not a unanimous yes, people had doubts, but I kind of followed my gut feeling. I said, this is the person we need. This is the person who is going to make things happen for us. And it was, it was really, uh, something that paid for us. He was a, a remarkable engineer. Uh, for years, I've relied on him. Uh, and, and not just me, actually. The, he was a go-to person for the entire company. So it was, uh, it was great hire, great hire. Um, some decisions not as good. <laughs> so uh, as a leader, you have to, uh, you know, you're not everything that you do is going to be right. Uh, the important thing is to actually um, realize that uh, you've made a mistake and kind of course correct as soon as possible, as opposed to letting it just like sit there, you know. So uh, I had to make some, you know, tough choices and let some people go as well, but those are some, uh, some of those, some bad decisions, but along the way, moving along. And then uh, moving along to, you know, we were growing really fast, so it, it, you know, quick journey to leading teams of teams and transitioning to sort of, uh, the hardest thing to, for an engineer to do is to delegate, right? It's like it was a journey. It was a journey when you actually start to delegate things, uh, but focus more on uh, mentoring, on coaching, on helping the team do better. Um, and along the way, uh, I uh, something I realized is that I love working with people. You know, the the the, the, the engineers, the people, as much as I love working with uh, technology. So uh, that was a very, very sort of uh, uh, rewarding journey as well. Right, so with at and we started to see this wonderful, uh, powerful network effect. If we were good enough for at and we were good enough for a lot of the other wireless operators out there. So they chose us uh, and our global footprint grew bigger and bigger all across the world. Um, and um, with these operators, uh, we started to see all these big companies like Coca-Cola, GM, Uber, a lot of, lot of great uh, companies, uh, ChargePoint, etc. So they all started to come on our platform. So we started to really take off. All right, so this is, uh, end of 2015 um, so we were you know widely known as the IOT cloud uh, platform leader uh, in the industry um, we had been innovating for 10 years and we had about 405 people in the company so this is uh, 
and we had began to see this uh, hockey stick increase in our uh, number of connected devices. So there were about 20 million devices connected on our platform and it was really quite amazing. So we had uh, thinking about going for IPO, we had filed our S1 and but then um, Cisco came along and um, we felt that uh, with Cisco's power, with the, the distribution and all of that, this would be, we would get to our vision of a billion devices faster. So that was, uh, it had taken us six years to grow 50x from 0.4 to 20 million devices and you know we would we were really wanted to escalate and we wanted to do it quickly uh, so get another grow another 50x uh, over the next 10 years so that was uh, around acquisition um, so after that this is where we are now we are today so 2.5 years two and a half years since acquisition we've grown about 5x uh, we hit uh, 100 million devices connected uh, last month so really <laughs> excited about that and um, you know so big milestone for us but uh, of course we're not going to stop there so we'll just uh, keep growing <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know looks like it's doable right doable <laughs> <laughs> all right I'm pretty much on time so if anybody has any questions I'll take them now What are the various devices? I know cars is one of them. What are the other devices? Yeah, so there's, there's all kinds of devices. Like, so uh, there's cars, uh, there's home security, uh, there's Uber, uh, the, the drivers, uh, the Uber devices. There's um, uh, uh, aero, uh, lots of these devices that are iPads, but they are IoT devices. Uh, one such device is used by pilots um, uh, American Airlines pilots to look at weather and all of that flight information. So these are all uh, just everywhere. There are just devices. Yeah. They have to buy a chips or uh, a NICs for those from us, right? So what we uh, what we do is we we sell through the operators, uh, and uh, what the operators send to these devices is the SIM card, and they use standard uh, the standard ecosystem to. Uh, to use the SIM card to connect to the cellular network. Yeah. Who are your competitors in this area? So our biggest competitors in this area uh, are the wireless carriers themselves, because they can offer this, right? So uh, for instance, AT&T. AT&T had uh, a own product. Uh, it was called Enterprise On Demand. They had their own product, and then we had a control center. But soon they realized that, uh, you know, because we are moving so fast, we are, so they, they said, well, you know what, we are going to move all of our devices on the EOD system to Jasper. So, but, but there are, there's, they also offer these kind of services. There's Vodafone is the biggest competitor, actually. Uh, so I have a question here. So how is it connecting to the home security? Like, uh, home security itself is a big field, so... How do you? How does Jas Jasper and Home Security work together? Correct, correct. So the ADT boxes, like I'll take example of ADT. So ADT is the box, right? That uh, you would sell uh, to, as is a home security box. So same thing. The ADT box, when uh, before, prior to uh, Jasper, it would use the landline to connect to their home like from your home to the ADT central, right, whatever, data center. So uh, one of the things we had heard is that the, you know, uh, when the robbers would come, they would cut the main uh, phone line and then actually it stops working. So what they do now is they have wireless connectivity in ADT. So same, think of it, same thing. Just like your cell phone is connected, in the ADT box you would put a SIM card and it would have wireless connectivity. And that's wireless connectivity is provided by Jasper. And then after that, you can have software on the device that 
is given by ADT, they can control, they can, uh, the device can send a SMS and it can have data connections, it can do all of that. I have a question. I'm in industrial IoT and I was wondering what are some areas where you think we have the best synergies between Control Center and the broader Cisco product portfolio? Right, right. <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's a uh, uh, very, very good question and uh, something that we are exploring. So, uh, uh, you know, Ilango is in the team and we have uh, a lot of uh, in the room and we have, um, uh, we are now working with Liz. Uh, so I don't necessarily have the answers we are exploring. Yeah. Hi, how are you pricing the uh, Jasper product in terms of licenses and services and so forth? Right, right. So uh, it is uh, software as a service. So uh, depending on, so it is per device uh, software and we started off with um, uh, you know, um, a rev share. So we don't sell directly, we sell through the operators. So whatever, however the operator sells, uh, we get a revenue share of um, the price. But uh, we are exploring more, uh, recently we're exploring uh, different kinds of model as well where it would, it would be fixed price per device. But it is definitely a recurring revenue. So you pay monthly per device, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Yeah. If they don't speak to the sure, 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 sure. So the question is who gets the bigger chunk, the operator or you? So, um, yeah, um, it depends on how well we negotiate, right? But, uh, yeah, uh, so generally the operators will, you know, they, it is their network, so, and we are providing service. <laughs> that information, so yeah. What does uh, innovation mean from a Jasper perspective? Is it more operational performance and scalability or because the, the actual features that your clients are enabling through the connectivity, that's you know the features I'm familiar with as an end user? Yeah, so the answer is all of the above, all of the above. So there are certain features that are used by, so uh, if you think about it, we are, we are running a service and uh, we sell this service to the operators who then sell it to customers like Amazon or ADT or them. So there are certain things that uh, the, and then, uh, then the device manufacturers, there are certain things that the Amazon and the ADTs of the world are looking for. They're looking for uh, the ability to activate, deactivate. They're looking for um, you know, how they can manage these devices. There are certain things that the operators are looking for. And then there are certain things that we are looking for. We are looking to manage our cost. We are looking to be uh, reliable. So there is, we consider innovation at all those layers. The features that the enterprises are using, like maybe there could be rich set of APIs or business rules or uh, a billing uh, uh, billing arrangement. That is that we we and we also look at technology innovations and our ability to offer more diagnostics or um, uh, big data analytics or all of that as and, and as well as a lot of the innovation comes from. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the data stores, right? How, how are we keeping our cost uh, within our control? So we have to take advantage of technology to make those things happen l at large scale, uh, high volumes, and reliably. So it's innovation in all of these areas, uh, as you rightly pointed out. So, yeah. So as uh, IoT devices inside cars get more and more common, so they're talking about like devices talking to each other, whereas most of the stuff that you showed where it kind of goes back to the central, how does that model change as you have device, different devices? So may not be just car and car, it could be, I don't know, car and something else. Uh, how does that change like how you would uh, deal with <coughs> such devices? So, uh, so our model is the device talks to uh, the central. And so, but, but uh, you could use the standard, for instance, you could use SMS, 
like device to device SMS. So it would go to the hub and come back to the other device. So uh, that would be how that would how we would think about it. But not sure. Yeah, we don't do peer to peer. We do uh, device to the central. Yeah. So. Um, how many devices are there currently now? I know this is just a subset. So of the larger pie, how, how big is it and how is it growing? And then also, how is this connected to our enterprise networking strategy with campus and IoT and all the mo mobile devices proliferation? So how many devices are uh, there overall in the market? Um, that's the first question, right? So um, I think, um, Somebody else knows the answer? I don't know. <laughs> know the answers to those questions. Uh, I believe there are about six, you know, the, there, there are projections that say 60 billion, 80 billion, like that uh, in 2020, but I'm not exactly sure how many they are connected today. Okay, uh, I, I have <coughs> right here, yeah, so I have a non technical question about culture. Yeah. So you said that you, you were like small and very innovative and then you decided to join f uh, force with a powerhouse like Cisco. So what was your like rosy vision of how the simulation would happen and when you kind of hit ground, how was the reality? <laughs> <laughs> like it, just, just to get an insider's perspective because uh, uh, like there are integrations and not all of them, you know, go as great as uh, the success we've seen with uh, Jasper. I want to remind you we are live streaming to YouTube. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, so no, I think, uh, um, uh, like I mentioned, the reasons for us uh, to uh, come on board with Cisco was that we would use, uh, we would be able to leverage Cisco's resources to uh, fast track our uh, mission of going to a billion devices, right? So, and the other thing uh, is that Cisco does acquisitions, acquisitions really, really well. I mean, we at least felt that. Uh, uh, it was quite seamless. Uh, it happens in phases. So the first phase was very simple. You got a new badge and uh, you had your new IT integration done and we were kind of in our own building and uh, we were working as is sort of. Then we had a little bit more integration, more with uh, um, uh, security compliance and all of that that uh, Cisco is very well known for. So. Uh, more, uh, you know, getting compliant with the processes and all of that of Cisco. So, uh, you know, it was a slow uh, integration. And then fast forward to now, uh, we moved into the Cisco building um, just last month, actually. So it has, uh, because it has, it's not all at once, it is slowly happening. Uh, so you get used to a certain, doing in a certain new way, and then a little bit more happens, and then you get used to a certain way. So I think that has helped a lot with the overall integration and uh, keeping the team uh, not feeling like too many things are changing at the same time. So one change at a time, you get used to it, and another change, another change. And then over time, you start to feel that, yeah, we are part of Cisco now so that's that's really uh, what has been happening and I think it has been uh, done quite well uh, we are now getting to the point where we will be integrating with the larger Cisco ecosystem uh, how industrial IOT works how the kinetic team has been working so uh, we are now you know getting to that phase So I saw that you had a slide on a 3G network, and we already went through 4G, LTE, LTE, LTE and now we're coming to 5G. 5G. That's right. So now yeah. that we're going to 5G, what are the plans? What are the changes in strategy, or how do you plan on to leverage everything that's coming with 5G with Jasper? Right, right. So like I said, the, the landscape when we started was actually 2G and then we went to 3G and then we added LTE. So we are designed for change. Uh, we, are, we are constantly making changes. So when we started off, we only did the integration with the HLR. Uh, there was no LTE at that time. So when LTE came along, we uh, also did the integration with HSS and sort of added that to our portfolio so uh, so we we did done that we we also did more of real time integration with the pcrf uh, and others so we are already talking about integrating with the 5g uh, uh, network elements uh, we're exploring that and uh, so 5g is still sort of baking it's not 
fully out there. There is nobody really uh, fully deployed on that. So we 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 are planning. We we will. So our our uh, infrastructure is designed for change, and uh, we'll just add those layers as we move along. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question on the WebEx. Um, so massive amounts of data is generated by these billions of devices. Does Jasper Analytics Arm publish or share this information in terms of gigabyte per month? Um, and is this av information available um, like to consumers or like by segment and, and also like by uh, types? So um, uh, the answer is no. We don't uh, make this data available to anybody at the moment. Um, and we also, so we are like FedEx. So uh, you have a packet that goes from one place to the other. Uh, it uses our network and the packet goes. So we don't actually peek into the packet and see what's in the packet. But we do have data on how much, uh, you know, which device, uh, what is the average bandwidth that the device is using and all of that. So this metadata, it is not uh, analytics data of the device. So. Um, we have the data, we don't actually publish it anywhere, no. We have a question right over here. Um, so as more and more devices are getting connected, right, as you mentioned, there are a lot of uh, packet movement happening, right? So it's definitely um, uh, intensive operations going on. So how do you, how do it's currently working and what are your plans to scale it to 100 million devices? We are already working at 100 million devices. So, so, billion yeah. devices. To a billion devices, right? So uh, that's why, I, uh, yeah, very good question. So uh, like I said, our, uh, our initial design is to break the big problem down into smaller set of problems, right? So a billion devices is not connecting all in one area. So we have these concept of pod, which is a container. And uh, it's a uh, two, uh, two DCs, uh, active, passive, and so this, each pod is meant to scale up to 10 to 20 million devices. And we are already running at that scale for a couple of the pods, because at 100 million, we've got one pod, we've got, um, we've got 15 plus pods all over the all over the world. Uh, uh, majority of our pods in North America, some are in China, uh, some are UAE. Uh, so we've got and a couple of them in Europe. So we've got a lot of these pods. So each pod uh, is built to scale uh, and we uh, continue to in increase that for 10, 10 to 20 million. So if we need more, we put another pod up. That's the design. Yes. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> let me ask a very tricky question. And uh, I understand you do database update, mm -hmm. or even a database technology update, without taking a downtime. How do you do that? Right. So uh, we. Uh, so did so yeah everybody got the question right so we are doing uh, database upgrades without like we update the database schema uh, without taking a downtime so when we design our product uh, when we do our deploys uh, the a very core uh, function of it is that it uh, we only so it has to be forward and backward compatible so we have one release and when we do the next release of the same code uh, we assume that the database could be one, one uh, release forward or whatever. You can't plan for forward, but it has to be backward compatible. So, and it has you, what we do first is we upgrade the database. So the old code is still working on the new database schema. And then we upgrade the code. So it is done like that. And if it doesn't work, then we roll back. Uh, hi, uh, I'm just asking a very basic technical question. So there's the concept of 4G LTE and there's also a concept of uh, VoIP, actually voice over internet protocol. So can you achieve internet of things with the VoIP also? And is there a bandwidth limitation with VoIP or is it the same? So I just wanted to know the difference. So I, I actually am not that familiar with uh, voice over IP, so I wouldn't be able to answer that question. But because we've been working with 3G, 4G, LTE, you know, so yeah. So the question is more of, you say your pods are all over like UAE and China. 
but the, yeah, these devices that are connected right now, they are more in US or they are also worldwide? They are worldwide. So suppose it was Rico and then we had that uh, natural disaster and your pod was there. Would it affect only the Puerto Rico devices or it will affect the worldwide? Like how is it? Correct, correct. That's a very good question. So we try to, um, so we are designed for disaster recovery. We are designed to, so we, uh, when we have a pod, we are, a pod has two data centers. So for instance, let me take the, the, our biggest pod, which is pod one, on which we have at and It has two data centers, one in Santa Clara, one in Phoenix. So let's say Puerto Rico, one of them was not in Phoenix, but in Puerto Rico. What we can do is fail over to geographic, it's geographically redundant. So we have two data centers, one is active, one is passive. And so if you have a, a natural disaster in one of the data centers, you can quickly fail over to the other data center. So that, uh, that would be the first line of defense. And we've done that uh, sometimes, even not just for disaster recovery, but maybe there's a problem uh, in that pod, for, in the data center for some reason. So we, uh, in order to, remember we have very little time where we can be down. So we have to be up all the time. So we, that is the first set uh, of regard. And to answer your second question, would only Puerto Rico users be affected or everybody else? So it depends on uh, who all are sharing that particular pod. Uh, so AT&T data is very separate from China Unicom data. The China Unicom data is kept in, uh, it, it is in the China data center. So they, they will be complete. So we call it a blast radius. So the, these different pods, they actually give us a good blast radius as well. So if there is a problem in China, it has no impact on uh, uh, the AT&T users or European users. If there's a problem in Europe, then it has no impact on other countries. But even within uh, that data center, if there is a problem, we can fail over to another geographically redundant data center. All right. Is that the end of your is that, that is the end? That is the end? I actually had one question. All right. <laughs> Um, so there's been a lot of changes or uh, newer technologies with the cloud mm -hmm. uh, technologies out there. I was just curious, how do you keep your systems up to date and uh, reflecting the newer technologies? How, do, For example, your APIs, the API methods, how, where does Jasper fall and how do you keep up with the newer things? Right, right. So, uh, you know, that has been, uh, it's, it's, we have been up now for what, 13 years. So technology, uh, what was there uh, when we started is completely changed, like REST APIs. They were, you know, nobody used REST APIs, so we started with SOAP APIs. Uh, like there was no concept of NoSQL, there was no LTE. There was, it's, it's a constantly evolving landscape. Uh, and uh, we, that's why we do the three weeks release. So we are, we are designed, to upgrade every three weeks. Um, we are designed to take small pieces and do upgrade them, plan for rollback if the upgrade doesn't work. Uh, and that's how we have been able to keep up with technology. And it is, um, it's a hard problem to solve. It is not easy, uh, especially uh, uh, at scale, uh, real time, uh, and being reliable. So it is a very hard, hard problem to solve. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, we've been doing it. We've been doing it uh, every three weeks. Uh, you know, we, we do our rolling deploys and uh, we, small, small changes, nothing big, no big changes, very small, incremental, deliberate, uh, and always with the ability to roll back if it's not working. Uh, Hi. Uh, very interesting talk. I work in security, so I'm curious how early uh, you start factoring in concerns around, say, data security uh, with the scale and the five nines goals. I mean, where, when did you start factoring in uh, resistance to denial of service type attacks? And are there any security incidents or specific challenges you can share with us? Sure. So, uh, like I said, that's how we started. It's, we started as early as 2005 to start, that was, uh, you know, uh, the overall, the, the security infrastructure was put in place uh, in 2005. Uh, 
uh, we've made some changes, but uh, at, at incrementally some of the changes, but we thought about most of these things because you know even though IOT was not a big deal uh, in 2005 internet had sort of uh, you know uh, quite matured by that time so uh, yes denial of service uh, data security so we are a SaaS offering right so uh, it is a multi-tenant uh, data center so we, we designed for uh, for it to be multi-tenant up front uh, with with uh, role-based access control on the in, uh, coming in and then going into the data security we we use hibernate to call, uh, talk to the, uh, the the database layer so we have uh, something called the hibernate interceptor which kind of uh, enforces the data security at that la la layer so uh, all of that so yeah okay. thank you Uh, trying to uh, distinguish between kinetic platform and Jasper, like because we have a lot of customers who have you know mobile who, who are mobile connectivity and then there is other sorts of sensors which are not mobile specific. That um, how do the two platforms kind of intertwine and kind of catering to a solution? And, you know, yeah. So uh, we do like I mentioned that uh, you know we are we are beginning to uh, you know integrate with the Cisco landscape and uh, come up with more integrated solutions. So that will be something that we will be working on uh, in the future. But as I mentioned, for us, uh, we don't peek into the data. So the data is, um, we, are, we are providing the connectivity uh, through wireless and uh, the data goes from here to there. Now, if you couple that with what Kinetic does, they uh, offer other ways to to connect, they offer ways to understand the data, I, I believe, also have applications that can uh, analyze the data for you and uh, come up with more insights. So I think it will play really well uh, together. So, uh, you know, we uh, will we'll do that in the future. Question number next. Ah. So we want to know, say, with a lot of these IoT networks, um, how do you like scale for uh, things that need um, light, uh, light bandwidth to versus large bandwidths with higher numbers of connections? Um, so just how do you like plan for these different peaks? Right. So, uh, for instance, a connected car or a connected laptop would be using large amount of data, right? Whereas uh, um, a simpler, more like a home security device is not going to use that much. Some of them are mobile, some of them are fixed. So um, some of it is capacity planning. So a lot of it we handle by capacity planning to look at, uh, that's why we have this concept of the pod, right? So how we, uh, what is the capacity that we can support for these set of devices? Uh, some of so we we intermingle all of that, and then we come up with uh, an average capacity for a pod. And if you exceed that, then you go to the next pod. So some some devices may be com using high bandwidth, some may be very low in there. Uh, and and one measure for us is the as i mentioned cdrs so call data record they tell us what how much bandwidth does a sim card use you know because we are using that to charge uh, our customers so um, there are three things that we actually scale first is uh, data that we get you know it is one to one correlation with uh, a device so if there's a device, what kind of provisioning activities are like that? You know, uh, you don't often change a rate plan. You don't often activate or deactivate. So it is kind of one to one with the number of devices. Then comes the second stage of the CDRs. So an average device will be creating about three CDRs, three to four CDRs per day. Some could be doing 10 CDRs per day. So that's uh, three to four times or five times. And then there are these uh, network events that each device generates. So uh, SS7 signaling and uh, all sorts of uh, diagnostics data and they scale at a much higher uh, higher level. So per device we could be getting 10 to, uh, 10 to 50 events per day for a device. So that's how we've kind of evolved our data stores. 
um, for the provisioning data store we we don't have to scale that much for the usage data store which is the CDR kind of data uh, we have to scale a lot more so then that database is uh, a little bit more powerful database uh, we keep that in Oracle because of other uh, properties of uh, Oracle database and then for the diagnostic data which has to be scaled at a much higher rate uh, we have started to use uh, the NoSQL I mentioned, Jasper Vault. Uh, that's where we, we have a little bit more play, so we use uh, NoSQL heavily uh, and, and, and keep our cost down as well as manage the high write rate uh, in our. Um, so, yeah, so different techniques to uh, scale different types of data that we see per device. But uh, that's why we have the thing of 10. To 20 million devices per pod uh, and we have been able to uh, keep our data stores in a different uh, different types of data stores to make that happen we also have Hadoop uh, that we use for analytics and uh, keeping our uh, big data in there yeah mm, somewhat related I think uh, my question was on the scale um, so you mentioned I mean you are already at 20 million devices right so 100 million, million devices, devices. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> a little different <laughs> yeah, so my question was uh, did you design for that level of scale or did you have to change your design in between to accommodate as you go yeah right so what we designed for is change we designed for uh, as i mentioned when we started off uh, we kept it very simple um, it was going to be the data oracle database and but we knew that over time we are going to get massive amount ma massive amounts of data so we have to change so that's that is why i went over those five principles that we will upgrade every three weeks we are prepared to change and we have built our platform in a way that you can change component by component over time so uh, did i know about no sequel when we started uh, uh, not at all but then as we uh, started getting more amounts of data, we said, you know what, this is not working. So uh, we designed, like I mentioned, uh, uh, the Jasper Vault. Uh, I wrote the Jasper Vault. It was an in-memory key-valued database where you could access the data really quick and support high writes. Um, so we did that. And then, uh, and, then, and then we found that there are open source out there that are going in that direction. Uh, it was a good validation of what we had come up with. And then uh, we picked, we did an analysis of all the NoSQL solutions out there. We looked at MongoDB, we look at, looked at Tokyo Cabinet, and we looked at Redis, and we, Redis was the one that we decided. And these upgrades, uh, they are not simple to do. They take a long time because uh, they have to be rolling upgrades. So when we do the upgrade from Vault to the Redis server, you have to populate both in parallel at the same time and have uh, the platform read from the old database but populate the new database at the same time. And then one day you cut over to the new database. Uh, and if the cutover doesn't work, then you have to go back, fall back to the old style. So uh, these things, they take massive amount of planning. Uh, massive amount of design and work uh, from the team so uh, yeah so we are uh, so we didn't design for all of this but what we designed for is change I would say and and we have been changing okay I think we're done with questions I want to thank Sparna for presenting thank you. thank you thank you so much that was great and thank you all for coming and next month, we're going to have Jonathan Davidson, uh, the GM of the uh, Service Provider Business Unit, talking about service provider side of things. Thank you all very much.